All right. It is 11.45 on the Thursday of Dreamforce. You guys have made it. You've made it this far. I know this is my ninth Dreamforce here. My name's James Ferguson. I'm on the platform product management team. My ninth Dreamforce here. I know that uh, it's been a long haul to get here from Monday morning. Seems so far away, I bet. I'd like to thank you. Appreciate you showing up to talk about big objects and how we're bringing big data to the Salesforce platform. One of the reasons why I'm here, I hope one of the reasons you're here, is data, right? There is now more and more data everywhere. You have more customers. You're collecting more data about those customers, and you're keeping them for longer periods of time, maybe because you want to do historical analysis, maybe because you've got compliance issues. But really, fundamentally, you've got this explosion of data that you want to manage within the Salesforce, within your Salesforce platform, within your Salesforce application. And the reality is, is big data is hard, right? There is a lot of complexity there. Sure, you can go spin up boxes on Amazon and get infrastructure, but you still need to maintain it, you still need to configure it, you still need to integrate it into your Salesforce environment. All of these things take a lot of energy, a lot of expensive resources, uh, a lot of money in general. And one of the things we at Salesforce have always tried to do is simplify these things, to provide that platform as a service rather than just this low-level infrastructure. And that's really what we're looking to do with big objects and Async Sockle. So I did a presentation on Async Sockle yesterday, uh, and I'm going to focus more on the big object side today, but both of them the fundamental purpose is to take all of this power of these new technologies, whether it's HBase and MapReduce jobs and Hadoop infrastructures and Phoenix, and make it accessible to people who don't know how to write a MapReduce job. You shouldn't have to write or be able to write a MapReduce job in order, to, um, in order to get value out of the data in Salesforce. We want to be able to surface this in ways you know. Things that look like custom objects, custom fields, field level securities, permission sets and permissions with CRUD permissions, APEX. All of those things that you know should be enough for you to take those skills and apply them to the big data world with big objects. If we look at a couple of the reasons why people use some of the ideas that we've seen over the years as we've pushed forward with this product is People want to store more data as part of a customer 360. Maybe it's point of sale data to do analysis or point of sale data to expose via community. Maybe it's a marketing engagement that you, are, that you have all of the different touch points you have with your customer. Once you start getting lots of volume and it starts becoming unreasonable to have it within a custom object today. Audit and tracking is actually the first thing we at Salesforce use big objects for, uh, which was uh, particularly in Field Audit Trail, set up audit his, um, field history archive, where customers have literally billions of records of field history archive of, of audit data there, and they need a place to put it where they can access it uh, all in one place. And this is a place, and Big Objects provides that uh, repository for them. And then there's historical archive. A lot of times, especially after a year, two years, three years, you start collecting data in your standard objects, in your custom objects, within your core data model. And you don't want to throw that data out. Nobody wants to throw data out right now, but they also don't want it getting in the way of performance of reports on opportunities or getting in the way of list views on tasks. And so be able to create a place for a historical archive to keep this uh, long tail of data, whether it's for compliance, whether that's for just general availability. So as you look at how we've approached big objects, there's really a few key points that we've tried to, a few key design principles, I've called them, that we've tried to keep sort of close to our heart in this. And that's one is the familiar metadata, right? We don't want you to have to learn something beyond what you already know. Maybe there's a few different behaviors here and there because of the scale, but fundamentally, uh, the goal is to make it familiar to you. And part of that is also integrating it into the whole back end of Salesforce that you've come to trust with disaster recovery and business continuity and all of those backup capabilities, all of those behind the scenes services that you've come to expect from Salesforce apply to big objects as well. We want you to be able to take that 
data in that big data and make it part of your overall data model. Integrate it into your data model and do it in a way that it's consistent performance. So it's not the, cha the challenge you get, can get into where you work in development with 100 records and it's blazing fast and then you roll out and it starts to slow down and it starts to slow down until you get to a point where it starts timing out. We don't want to be in that problem. We want it to behave with a billion records the same as it might behave with 100 records. So let's take a look at what we've got here. Um, and I'll bring this up. So when we talk about what is a big object, a big object looks just like a custom object, right? And so this is the metadata. Uh, I'm going to use the metadata API to create a new big object. This one, just for the demo, it's got fields, just like a custom object has fields. Uh, in this case, I've got some text. I've got some number. We can support dates. We can support long text. All of these things, just standard meta Salesforce metadata. There is this new section that I'll talk about um, I'll talk about the purpose, but fundamentally, one of the difference between big objects and regular uh, custom objects, Salesforce objects, is we don't have the standard 15-digit ID. We let you choose your primary key. You choose your ID for these fields made up of multiple fields. In this case, I've chosen two, field one and field two, uh, to be part of that primary key. And that is going to, as I show you more, that is going to be key in how we can query it. But then ultimately, we can take this. Oh, and before I forget, like with many things, we also want to have a permission set, right? By default, the field level security is going to be disabled for this. So you want to generate um, a permission set so you can assign to users. Profiles would, of course, work as well. But I, I tend to like permission sets and, um, and object permissions. So this is a way that we can make sure people who need access can have access. Now, I'm going to use the uh, Salesforce DX command line to do the force deploy. I happen to have a directory. I'm going to wait. It's going to take a couple of seconds uh, in order to do this. It's got these different components. While I'm there, I can, uh, it will probably show up soon. I can go up, and I can look for my big objects in here. And it's come up here as this DF17 demo. And you can see it's got fields. Uh, it's got names. It's got this indication of uh, index. All of this very much like uh, custom objects. And so very much integrated. And now this object flows in with the disaster recovery and the backups and the, and the business continuity pieces as well. But that's not uh, particularly interesting from a demo perspective. So let's take another example. Those who were at the session last, yesterday may look familiar. But here's an example where I've got the accounts and orders, standard objects. Uh, I want to create this. I know I've got too many line items to fit in a custom object, so I've got this big object to represent these order line items, which also happen to have a, a relationship to product, because an order line item tends to be a customer buying a product. right? So this is the scenario I've got. And let's take a look at uh, the big object in our piece. I have big order item, because it's, uh, it's a big object capturing order items. And again, it looks like a standard uh, piece of metadata, standard object metadata. We've got uh, numbers. We've got a long text area. And it's integrated with the data model. We have a lookup to the standard order object. We have a lookup to the uh, standard product object. So these can now be viewed together. So what does, this, what does this give us? Well, it gives us some things like the ability to query it via SQL. Let me log into Workbench everybody's favorite uh, API tool. And I can, big objects show up. You can see it's got an underscore underscore B to differentiate it. And I can go through and I can say, let's look at order, let's quantity. And I can pull these up and it comes back 0.25 seconds. It says it's got, it's got the SQL query, right? This is, this is standard. It's even got some of the standard uh, uh, relationship magic. So I can do, uh, let's see, order number. And let's make sure I'm typing it right. I can do order.name. And now not only is it querying this big object, but it's also pulling the names from these and the order numbers from these standard objects. So I can display it. One of the things about demoing things that look like custom objects is they sort of behave like custom objects. And so you say to yourself, well, that looks like a custom object. Now, one of the key differences here is uh, found on the storage usage page, which is one of my 
favorite pages these days. I'm, I'm, I'm weird that way, uh, that I like the storage usage page. But here we, ho here we have an example. I've got, you know, just shy of a million uh, accounts, 840,000 accounts, which is a reasonable number. Generated 10 million orders for those accounts, you know, 10, um, 100 per, per account. That's, that's a, 10 million is a big number, right? But not that bad. What's different about this and what's different about big objects is the scale that we can go to, right? So now we have in this, or in this line item object that I've been querying, we have a billion records in there, right? Or just two and a half million over a billion records. And yet we can still, um, we can still issue these queries and get this response back very quickly and display the data as you want. Uh, so what we can, um, what can we do? So now with this, we can, you know, what can we do once we can query it with Sockle? Well, we can go into our developer console. Lightning components, who loves lightning components? Who's gonna love lightning components as soon as they get back and try all the cool stuff that they learned uh, over the last three days? All right, this is a lightning component. I'm not gonna go into too much detail about the, about the fact that it's a lightning component. It looks a lot like a lightning component. But the important thing is, again, this is integrated. I can use this big object just the way I can use, um, I can have a variable representing this big object just the way I can have it as a standard or custom object. I can uh, query the, use the same controller interface, I can still use the same helper, and calling a piece of Apex. And this piece of Apex is, again, using a big object just as though it were a custom object or a standard object, querying it and filtering it, passing this parent ID. What that lets me do is go back to my order page, and I can do something like edit the page. <clears throat> and so now I can take this, let me find my, uh, oh, I got a, let me just add a tab. I can add a custom tab. I'm gonna call it order items. In that tab, let me drag this in using our fancy. Even in the preview mode, I'm able to query that billion record object and display it uh, in the list. <clears throat> I can save it. I can go back. And with luck, we now have this. And here, so, so now I can go. And so now I can look at different orders. All of this is then pulling that data back from that billion record object on that. <clears throat> so it's. There's a reason why we can do this fast, and it's related to the indexes. Go back to my object. I have uh, designed this big object in order, really in order to support this query that I wanted to display, right? So I have said that this order relationship, this order ID that's in there, is the first element of the primary key which means that I can query by it, right? So if I just steal this ID out of the URL, I can do order ID equals that. And instead of getting order number 25549, uh, and let me just go back since it's overridden that. Order number, and I'll spell it right. I've got uh, order 5123374, so it's a different set. But because it's part of that primary key, I know I can uh, do it. I, I can do it. I can also, I know the second, second element of that key, if we look at the big object, the second element of that key is item number in index position two, which also means I can do where item number maybe is less than four or five, doesn't matter. And you can see now I'm just bringing back, I'm bringing back the four, one, two, three, four, because that's less than five. That's all because of how I've designed the key, right? So one of the things that, for example, it doesn't let me do um, is, and you can imagine, and, and one of the things, the way I think about this primary key, it's sort of like if you think about a phone book, everybody know what a phone book is? People in the crowd look, yeah, look, look old enough to know what phone books are. It's not going to work for much longer. Um, but you know, as long as you know the last name and the address, you might have a book with two million phone numbers in it, but you can find that phone number very fast. 
However, if you try to find, give me all of the numbers for a particular product, um, or all of the, in the phone book case, all of the phone numbers for somebody on 4th Avenue, it's going to take you a long time. You might have to scroll through that whole thing. And so we don't, so if you see, if you try to do something where maybe total price is greater than uh, 100, it's not going to let you do this synchronously. It can't, you can't filter on this. And that is because we don't know. We, we want this to be consistent performance at scale. If this has a billion records, we might be scanning a billion records, and there's no way you're going to do that while there's an hourglass turning. But there is a solution. We provide a solution for that, which is taking this Sockle query and making it asynchronous. Right? So if I go and into here and pull up, here's an example of a Sockle query. Again, st standard, straightforward Sockle. We're doing sums of quantities, sums of prices, grouping it by product. And in this case, we're joining in this information from the order object, joining in that year and month from that date, and grouping it, right? So now I can get a sense for how is this product sold by month for each, for each product. So I can take this query, and in Workbench, I can go into Async Sockle. And now Async Sockle works in similar ways. I've got a similar picker, same fields show up. I'm going to cheat and just put my query in here and make it bigger so you can see it. Uh, but this is the same query here. But instead of when I hit, the, I'm not hitting submit to just run the query, what I need to do is say, OK, where am I going to put this data? Right? And so I've got, for example, in this example, a monthly product summary. So I've got a custom object I've got to capture this monthly summary by product uh, for each uh, for this data. So I'm taking this billion record data set and running a query across the whole thing to generate a much smaller, a much more manageable, and a much more, frankly, meaningful subset of data uh, within this monthly product summary. And I can map the fields. I'm going to map total price. I think it's total revenue in this case. Uh, the product has a product year, not surprisingly, has a year, uh, a month. Now I can do this, and this will generate new new results, right? I could even go so far as uh, if I wanted to put a unique identifier, I can tag it with the job ID into um, into some field on here that I might choose. But what I want to do really is I want to be able to run this job more than once, and not duplicate data, uh, and and just generate new data if there's new source data. And so what I can now do is do this as an upsert. Right? So now, with an upsert, I can take it and, uh, but, but I have another challenge with an upsert. Right? Upsert, Salesforce, one external ID. Right? But I really want this to be product year month is the thing that determines that individual record. And when I go and run this job again, I wanna, if it's the same product, the same year, the same month, I want to overwrite that value just like an upsert would. So how do I do that? Well, I can, do, I can pull things together. So I can do things like I can do some simple string substitutions in this uh, target value. And I can do month. And I can do, uh, and I can do product. <laughs> and now this will, and I've got this field that I'll use as the upsert ID. So now what will happen is when I run this, first of all, it'll take this query and run it across all billion records. But then the results it will take, and it will upsert this data back in. Now, I'm not going to run this. It'll take 15, 20 minutes, or, or maybe a bit more, depending on uh, the query. But uh, what I can do is show the results, like a good cooking show. You know, I put the, put the casserole in the top oven, and out of the bottom oven comes uh, the baked, the baked uh, ricotta, or whatever it is. <clears throat> so now I've got these products, again, the standard object. But I've got this summary. So now I can show this isn't going directly immediately to the source 1 billion records, because that wouldn't be, you know, that data hasn't changed since January. The January 2016 data hasn't changed. I don't need to go back to that source data every time. But I've taken that billion records and consolidated, condensed it down to, in this case, the 24 or something less than 24 um, uh, sales summary for this given product. I could pick a different product. And again, uh, get the summary for that particular product, all using standard 
standard reports, standard report charts, standard lightning components all dragged on to the user interface. So we now, um, we now not only have a way of storing the data, accessing that data in real time, but also providing this asynchronous job to execute across the entire data set. So um, where, does that, where does that leave us? First of all, some of you may not have noticed, there was no forward-looking statement uh, slide in this deck. It, is not, uh, it was not an accident. That was not a, an omission. We are now GA with big objects and async Sockle. Uh, it's, been, it's been a great uh, road that we've taken to get here, but we're now here. So uh, it is there. There is a trailhead that you can take, or a trail that you can take in trailhead called Big Object Basics. You can get started with big objects uh, in any developer org, in your production org, in any of your sandboxes. All of them have big objects enabled. We have a discussion group within the Trailblazer community, formerly the success community, where you can ask questions. Um, I monitor it, so I can answer some of them. More and more, and more you folks can answer, it, um, answer them yourselves. You've got, as I said, it's in your org. There's the base allocation is uh, one million records that you have to play with. Uh, and then, of course, you can expand capacity. We provide the ability to support. I showed you a billion records in this particular demo. Uh, and so we can expand that and get access to that async cycle. So I'm out of time. So if you have questions, I'm happy to take questions uh, uh, off to the side here. But thank you for showing up. Thank you for coming here by Big Objects. Thank you for coming to Dreamforce. You're almost there. You're almost at the end. All right? <laughs>